I am very, very excited to not only be joined by somebody who professionally I respect immensely, but also somebody that I'm, I'm proud to call a close friend, uh, Michelle Gaida, who's the Executive Vice President, Geopolitical Strategy and Risk at Weber Shandwick, and formerly at the State Department, former Acting Undersecretary of State for Public Affairs at the U.S. Department of State, and most importantly of all of that, Michelle, a Senior Advisor to Concordia. Uh, so thank you so much for agreeing to, um, to join us for Concordia Live today. Thanks for having me, Matt. It's good to be here. So Michelle, talk a little bit about this report. It's a, it's a new report that's coming from Weber Shandwick um, at, titled Global Business at the Geopolitical Frontlines. Uh, feels awfully relevant for today. Uh, tell us a bit about this report. Thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah, so this report, uh, Global Business at the Geopolitical Frontlines, uh, as evidenced by the title, is very much about this new role that global business, that multinationals are playing at the forefront of geopolitics. We've been very focused on COVID-19 and the global pandemic over the course of the past year as the world has fought to overcome that. At the same time, you've seen the contours of a very, uh, and perhaps less visible uh, trend come into play in terms of the geopolitical environment. It's this new era of great power competition uh, that businesses find themselves in the crosshairs of. And they'd say there's two things that make this uh, a different type of geopolitical arena and we've seen for the past 70 or 75 years. One is that you've got new rising and global powers challenging the core liberal values and institutions that have made up the world order for uh, since the end of World War II, over seven decades. And secondly, it's a geopolitical competition that's taking place across a number of domains, economic, technological, and information, more so than anything military or kinetic. And when it comes to the economy, when it comes to technology, when it comes to information, these are all areas, domains, arenas that multinationals can't help but touch, can't help but influence. And so for better or for worse, they find themselves in the crosshairs of geopolitical competition taking place in these areas. There's a lot of risk that comes with that on the one hand. There's also a lot of opportunity that comes with that on the other. So this report dives into what those trends are and focuses specifically on three of the top trends and risks to businesses and their reputation uh, given this new environment in 2021 and then likely beyond. So I'll just walk through the three of those real quick. The first is supply chains. They are in the public spotlight. They are in the political spotlight. And even before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we saw this renewed focus by countries on economic sovereignty or economic independence. That pushed the supply chain conversation even more so into the, the public debate and the political debate, uh, even before COVID-19 exposed a lot of vulnerabilities within global supply chains. Um, that will continue. It didn't start with the virus. It's not going to end with the virus. Um, but today, whether it's Make in India, whether it's Made in China 2025, whether it's Buy America or Made in All of America under President Biden here in the U.S. now, um, or Europe's start, uh, overall drive towards strategic autonomy, you have this renewed focus by countries and regions on uh, supply chains and their role in economic security and national security. And so multinationals in particular should expect a lot of public scrutiny when it comes to their supply chain operations and whether or not uh, they're playing by what different government stakeholders or even public and consumer stakeholders expect of companies when it comes to their supply chain operations and how they're doing business across borders. Um, and this is especially true when it comes to human rights issues. A lot of increasing scrutiny on human rights issues within uh, multinational supply chains. And you'd see conversations start to happen, particularly in Europe, as well as Asia, about the uh, liability of business when it comes to human rights violations within their own supply chain. So all this to say that a lot of public scrutiny now uh, when it comes to supply chains, we did a global media analysis and found that global media and social media mentions of multinationals, of supply chains and forced labor increased 282%, almost 300% uh, from 2019 to 2020. So you have a lot of, uh, of increased conversation in media and social around what companies are doing as far as their supply chain. So multinationals, their business leaders, communications leaders need to understand 
that supply chains are a new vehicle for policymakers, for the public, for consumers, for employees to assess whether or not a company is acting in the interests of a nation, um, in the economic interests of a nation, and whether or not those are aligned even with their own company and core values. That's risk number one. Uh, risk number two is technology competition. We've all seen over the course of the past few years, but especially over the course of the past year, in this era of geopolitical competition or great power competition, countries are starting to realize that control of key technologies is core to their economic prosperity and their national security. You see the US and China in particular calling on their own technology and innovation sectors to advance the national interests. Uh, President Biden even has identified disruptive technology as one of the great challenges of our time, alongside climate change and alongside the threat of nuclear war. He even went so far to say last year that corporations, when it comes to their role in this competition, have a responsibility to their employees, to their community, and to their country. We found, uh, and we did a survey uh, this month, February 2021, to understand whether or not home country is becoming a stakeholder to business uh, that is starting to intersect with emerging technologies. 77% uh, of Americans believe it's important that companies and organizations make company decisions that protect national security. 46% said it was very important. So almost half of Americans said it's very important for companies to make decisions uh, in terms of national security. So you've got a lot of public awareness now and expectations now for the role that companies, at least in the United States, are playing when it comes to advancing the national interest. Technology competition is certainly accelerating this. So multinationals are gonna have to start to consider home country government um, and citizens as stakeholders uh, of their business and think about how that factors into their business strategy as well as their communications. And then finally, uh, disinformation major risk to uh, businesses, multinationals, as well as um, uh, being both long-term in nature and urgent at the same time, given the role of economic statecraft, given the role of information statecraft in the geopolitical competition today. Um, these are tools, information statecraft, influence campaigns that uh, certain nations and certain states will use uh, to advance their own influence, to hinder that of others. And so multinationals, because they matter so much to the economic competition that's taking place, unfortunately are in the crosshairs of this competition and stand to become a target uh, for either hindering or advancing a certain nation's economic interests. And so the communications technology and advancements happening there make that even worse. Uh, this is bad news for multinational companies. You've got automation, bots, algorithms, computational propaganda that is accelerating the speed, the scale, the velocity of the way information travels today. That becomes really hard for companies to start to mitigate against. Uh, so where you have business leaders worried about a viral tweet over the course of the past few years, think about that at 5G speed now when you have computational propaganda flooding the information space. And so companies have to think about how they're building disinformation resilience as they're operating across borders. So these are just the three of the top risks um, that we see uh, to companies, to multinationals, uh, to their business, as well as their reputation and things that they need to start preparing for in terms of finding new communication strategies and principles to help uh, both mitigate risk on the one hand and seize the opportunities that this presents on the other. Thank you, Michelle, for, for covering that. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited to talk a bit about on supply chains, technology competition, and disinformation. Um, first question, though, um, to you on this overall report. It, one of its major conclusions, or at least uh, certainly um, the grounds by which this report is released, is that business is not what it was, right? No more business as usual. How has COVID more broadly, and I'm talking broadly here, what would your answer have been pre-COVID versus today? Because I feel, I could be wrong, but I feel like COVID was a game changer across the board, but maybe more in accelerating certain things, not necessarily completely changing the game. What, what would your, if you were releasing this report in February of 2020, um, would you have said that no more business as usual as well? 
Uh, yes and no. I think the word that you used, accelerate, is the right one. Uh, these trends aren't brand new, but they are certainly heightened given the, the trends that the COVID-19 pandemic exposed over the course of the last year. And I'd say at a high level, uh, what you saw with the pandemic was different countries who were already competing with each other, rising global and established powers, um, use the COVID-19 pandemic to argue for or against their visions of the future, the way that they approach problems, uh, global problems and global solutions. And you saw that competition play out. So, you know, are, are there bigger government solutions um, to addressing a global pandemic? Do you go through multilateral institutions or not? Do you take care of your country first or a region or, or a broader um, uh, countries across the globe. And so you see that type of, of competition and debate uh, take place across a number of countries that were already competing. So I would say these have all been risks. Like I said, supply chains were coming to the fore as, as countries were more focused on economic independence even before COVID-19, but it's accelerated, certainly. Um, same thing with technology as well as disinformation. So uh, it, it's certainly about the heightened risk that these now present. And, and geopolitics is always interesting because they're, they're long-term risks, but they're urgent at the same time. And if you're gonna address them and address them properly, our hope is that businesses will start to think about what they can do to mitigate risk, uh, rethink their communication strategies or, and their communications operations in order to do that now versus when these things become a crisis and you're scrambling to address them last minute. How much of this though is out of the hands of business to an extent. I mean, that's I, I, risk mitigation. Of course, if you're running an international corporation um, and and you, the standards are one thing in one country and the standards are completely different in another country, what what is that first step in terms of the power that business can play to both advocate for change, but also at what point do you sit there and say? There's there's no more that business could do. Government either has to step in or not, but there's no more that business could do to, to improve the situation or address the supply chain issue. It's a great point. What companies can do, even before a crisis hits, is build resilience into their system. So mm -hmm. these shocks are inevitable, and it's too hard to predict what is going to be an issue. So we've, we've seen supply chains uh, technology competition, disinformation come to the fore. But as 2020 taught us with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, shocks, epidemics, pandemics can come from anywhere. Uh, so the best thing that a business can do is start to build resilience into their, uh, to their organization right now. From a communication standpoint, that means building reputation resilience and reputation equity. So how are you increasing now, today, the awareness, the equity, the trust behind your organization, behind its values and what it stands for, so that when the inevitable crisis does happen, geopolitical or what have you, you come through it stronger and, and bounce back more resilient. So the, the proactive thing that organizations can do is start to build resilience now versus, again, a, attempt to deal with crises once they're already an issue. But what do you say to the CEO of a company um, that says, yeah, but I don't want to be an activist. That's not my job. I'm running a company. It's not necessarily about being an activist. I'd say to, to one of the points I made earlier, a multinational company, willingly or not, is a part of the economic, technological, and information competition that is taking place across countries and regions. So with that reality, what does that mean in terms of what a business needs to do in order to, at a minimum, protect its reputation? And on the other hand, use their, their reputation influence to advance certain values. Mm -hmm. um, so so it doesn't, it's, it's not optional about you know, participating or at least preparing for the risks that come with this new geopolitical environment, but at a minimum, understanding what these new trends are and making sure that uh, when there is a risk or there is an issue, you have enough resilience in your system, in your reputation to make it through stronger. Do you think that everything that's happened, uh, especially in the last 12 months, uh, only further emphasizes that, uh, frankly, supply chains have to go local? Um, that things are going, you know, that that we've seen countless examples of countries that have been kind of left in a in a huge lurch in terms of addressing COVID. Certainly, you think about the the global battle over things like PPE 
uh, E and all of all, all all of these different pieces of how does it how does a global community operate in this kind of environment? Doesn't it doesn't it put a great deal of pressure on governments to say let's let's go local rather than rather than go abroad? Yes, and you're seeing a huge push for that um, across different countries and regions. Uh, in India, for example, the new Make in India emphasis, Prime Minister Modi last summer, I believe it was in July, had posted on LinkedIn in an article and a vision for India as a new global nerve center of supply chains. And so they're doing a lot to attract manufacturing there for folks uh, where that would at least diversify if, if not localize their supply chains. You've seen a lot of legislation in the United States bringing together um, strange bedfellows like Mark, Senator Marco Rubio and Senator Elizabeth Warren together on supply chains uh, and strengthening the national security position of our supply chains, decoupling them um, from China, other places, so that we're not so dependent on things like pharmaceutical ingredients to get uh, into the United States. And so you're seeing this happen in a lot of places. Um, and I'd say, again, that push started even before COVID-19 pandemic, but was brought very much uh, front and center stage when the pandemic uh, shined a light on how dependent many regions were, uh, including in Europe, where they, I think morbid dependency was one of the phrases that uh, one of their, their um, leaders in the EU used. So they're driving towards strategic autonomy. So they're, they're trying to reshore to gain more control over their supply chains. Again, there's, there's public expectations about what companies should be doing to make sure that they're taking care of certain uh, consumers and customers. And then there's expectations on the part of policymakers that businesses also play along from a national security and economic security perspective. You in the report, you, you one of your three um, themes of this report is around technology competition. It's hard to even finish that sentence without immediately saying China. How are you going to see in the United States? Are do you expect more heightened pressure on companies in the United States to align their business interests with? Uh, with with U.S. government policy as it relates to China, even if that could be very damaging to potential business growth and business opportunity? I think the answer to that question is we'll see. But President Biden has made clear that a lot of the issues that were a priority under the Trump administration will continue to be when it comes to, to China and emerging technologies under a Biden administration, uh, in particular focus on intellectual property rights and um, data privacy, for example. I think the, the nuances and the details of those policies are still to be determined. He's only been in office for a little bit, but has indicated that those are gonna be priorities of his administration as well. So we'll see how those play out. But very interestingly, last October, you had uh, President Xi give a speech calling on the technology and innovation sector in China to help advance their vision for China as the leader in technology globally um, and to make decisions to advance that national interests. At the same time, the Trump administration had come out with a new strategy calling on the US innovation technology sector to do the same in areas of emerging and future technologies. And so you're starting to have this conversation about the role that companies should play in advancing the national interests. As I said earlier in a, in a campaign speech last summer, President Biden had said that co corporations and companies have a responsibility, not only to their community and, and their workers, but to their country as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that manifests when it comes to government policy in, in areas of emerging technology and what that means for multinationals playing there. Because as you know, almost every country is a uh, company is a technology company today. So how does that impact then business in the developing world? If it's if if where if if the elephant in the room, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, is U.S. and China, what does that mean uh, from a, a, a business perspective in terms of investing in new markets and developing economies? Well, from our perspective, a, a huge uh, consideration is going to be how businesses are communicating around the value and the values that their business, their products, their services in these areas of emerging technology are bringing to the world. And I use the example of the US and China, the, the, the speeches and the strategies that came out last fall, um, are they in fact advancing an open liberal democratic world order 
um, or you have President Xi's vision that is underpinned by a overall strategy that advances a socialist system with Chinese characteristics, as they say. And so I think businesses are gonna start to be measured whether it's in the developing world or even in their own backyard. How are their businesses, how are their products and services advancing values, interests of countries, as well as their own employees and consumers um, in the, the context of those competing visions of the future? Do you anticipate just taking a, a quick step back and, and, and uh, to a question that came through on the chat, in the way, for instance, that consumers have completely, uh, I think there's been enormous education for consumers to say, we want to know where our products come from. We want to know how they're made. We want to know that they're ethically sourced, right? This has been an enormous business trend, which has shifted the entire business community in terms of how they focus on these issues. We see that time and time and time again at Concordia. Do you see that same effect coming in terms of a, a public and a consumer that expects the same from 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 say let's 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 focus specifically on the U.S. You said fifty percent correct and, and do correct if I'm wrong here, but fifty percent roughly of Americans expect that companies will operate within the national interest. Do you expect that number to grow? Do you expect it to be that same trend line of? companies starting to brand and say, we're doing this and that in the national interest of the country and therefore buy our product? I think that is one of the emerging trends that we're starting to see. And so with the technology competition in particular is where you start to see this new conversation or consideration of home country as a key stakeholder. There's this large conversation going on around stakeholder capitalism that it's not just about shareholders anymore, but about employees, communities, uh, and, and uh, customers. What about country? Is that going to increasingly be a, a primary business stakeholder? When it comes to technology competition and the way that you see uh, governments as well as the public start to measure companies by if or how they're contributing to certain national security or, or economic security goals, um, you start to see that as an emerging trend. So. We'll keep our eye on it, but at this point, it means for business leaders and communications leaders at multinational companies, as they think about how they engage all sorts of stakeholders, um, it is well worth their while to start considering home country, uh, government and citizens as a stakeholder based on these new public expectations. And the poll that we did, and you're right, it was 46%, almost half, uh, say that's very important for a company to help protect the national interest. That's in the United States. Um, and there certainly have, have differing points of view across the globe. And so companies need to be aware of what the public and government uh, in every country where they operate, uh, where what their attitudes and perceptions are. And so that's where data and analytics and an understanding of your audience is really important to how companies are navigating this new geopolitical era. One of the, the other the other big pieces you flagged in this report is all around disinformation and at a time when one consumer can all of a sudden be incredibly powerful uh, because of Twitter and other social media platforms. It's given voice to consumers, which in many, many ways is, is a very powerful thing uh, and a positive thing, but in, in other ways can also lead to great disinformation. What is your top line advice to companies when their brand becomes more and more well-known and it's so easy to lose the narrative so quickly? The advice is that the time to build resilience is now. So it is very hard to come from behind when there's already misinformation or disinformation out there about your company and your brand. And up until then, you haven't done enough to make sure that the awareness and the cre credibility and the trust and the loyalty uh, to your company and to your brand isn't there. It is not the time to do that once you're already in a crisis. And so our recommendation to multinational business and communications leaders is to think about how are they building uh, equity and awareness and trust behind their company reputation, what it stands for uh, in terms of the value and the values that it's bringing to the world to do that now. So as mis and disinformation is out there, and, and business leaders should think about it as a, you know, when does it happen, not if. Um, when that happens, how do you make sure that you've already got enough equity behind your reputation to make sure that your, your customers and your employees and the public at large um, isn't necessarily, their perceptions aren't necessarily changed by one um, piece of disinformation. So to build that equity right now.
So this is the first iteration of this report. Again, global business at the geopolitical front lines. You, when you were at the State Department, led an enormous restructuring. Is that, is that to some extent what inspired you to, when I hear what you're saying, it's don't wait, be proactive, don't wait for things to come for you, be prepared for it. Is that what really inspired a lot of that restructuring at the State Department? Uh, yes, absolutely. So the, the communications environment is incredibly complex now, given the advancements of technology. So it's not just about social platforms anymore, but like I said, you've got automation and bots and algorithms and artificial intelligence influencing the communications landscape. You also, at the same time, have a very complex foreign policy landscape where it's not just about bilateral relationships anymore, but every country is deeply integrated economically, culturally, diplomatically. And so for any organization, whether it's the State Department or a multinational organization, has to rethink its communication strategy and its communications operations. That's what we did at the State Department. I was very proud to have led alongside my colleagues there. Um, the largest restructuring at the State Department in 20 years to completely rethink how we are communicating American foreign policy and American values to the world. That meant uh, major increases in data and analytics so that we could have a deep understanding of the global media environment, which is very diverse, very complex, very fast moving um, content creation, uh, an understanding of domestic and foreign media, et cetera. So I would uh, say, yes, it was very much driven by external realities, the communications realities and, and foreign policy realities, and that all organizations, including multinational companies, should think about how they are now structuring uh, their own communications operations uh, and operations writ large to navigate this geopolitical and communications environment successfully. Well, I think I think overall conclusion from from this report, and I encourage everybody um, to to read it. Don't wait, be proactive, and then we'll end it with this, and then come talk about it, Concordia. That's the perfect combination of everything. So, um, Michelle, thank you so very very much for sharing with us this report. Again, global business at the geopolitical front lines. A report by Weber Shandwick um, and uh, Michelle. It's it's a great pleasure and. Uh, very, very interesting insights, but but for sure around technology and disinformation, around supply chains, uh, technology competition. Um, uh, you know, these are issues that companies should not wait for problems to come to them because most likely they're coming. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Matt. Thanks to you and the, the whole team at Concordia. Thank you, Michelle.